Hi, everybody. My name is Jenna Johnson, and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> and um, I was supposed to do this last month, but I had such a nervous breakdown that it's taken me an extra 30 days to get my act together. I'm 74 years old. My 40th birthday, God willing, is September 9th. So trying to put that in 45 minutes is not easy. So I'm going to do the best I can. I must admit, um, now that I've been listening to people here, they've got 45 and 43 years. Um, at least some of them will understand what it was like when I grew up. I grew up in Atlanta. My father was an alcoholic. He was not a big guy. He was 5'7", but if, if you're a little girl, he was plenty big enough. I was frightened all the time. I was my mother's helper. I was the one who pulled up the chair and got the key off the door frame and locked him in the bedroom. And we did that a lot. I was very shy. I was very frightened. I had asthma. I was always anxious. And the only thing I had any fun with were horses, except that the way that worked out wasn't very healthy. And what I was trying to do was control horses because I had no control over my life. My father got sober when I was 13. And my mother, my mother's mother, was planning on taking me on a cruise that next summer. So daddy gets sober and my grandmother gives me four splits of rosé wine for Christmas so I can learn how to drink properly. Because in the 60s, nobody knew about alcoholism. Nobody talked about alcoholism. Um, all I knew was he was sick and I was angry. My mother continued to drink. And my I got survived school. I remember when I was 14, one of the girls at this little private school I went to got pissed off at me. And she I sat down at a table and she got everybody up and they walked away from the table, leaving me there by myself. So for most of the time. I was 14, I did not eat lunch, I just had crackers. So I go on this cruise, I'm allowed to drink. My grandmother was gonna let me have beer and champagne. And I explained that beer was fattening and I traded it for Tom Collins and I drank for six weeks. Um, I was never sober, nobody cared. I was 14, they, everybody thought I was 21 because I was all dressed up. And my grandmother wanted me with her for cocktails every night. So there were six weeks of all this insanity and then I came back to Atlanta, could not drink. As most kids, I was at that point going into my sophomore year and we did have parties and kids did get their hands on booze, and I did drink the liquor that was in my mother's house. My mother had liquor in the house. So we just kept on the way we had. And uh, I graduated from the school, same school I'd been to since I was in nursery school, all of 67 of us. And I went on to Tulane because you could drink at 18 in New Orleans. And I went to the, the women's college of Tulane called Sophie Dukum. And I, I was went through Rush and none of the sororities wanted me. There was something about me that just wasn't right. So in 1967, I became a hippie and smoked dope and ate diet pills and drank and survived. I got to my first Mardi Gras and I was wearing sneakers and I drank so much. I was I was walking around, but I was passed out. And when I came to, my legs were all bloody because I'd been walking through broken glass since Mardi Gras in New Orleans is fairly rough. I came back home for the summer and my mother and father said, you're going to get to be a debutante. 
Now, this sort of stuff was going on in Atlanta in the late 60s and early 70s, and I didn't want to do it. And my father said, if you're not going to be a debutante, you're going to have to move out of the house and find someplace else to live. And obviously, I was little. I couldn't do that. Um, the nice thing about being a debutante is that all of the parties have liquor. So I just kept drinking. I met a boy named Mac, and uh, he was at the parties with me. He was a nice guy. His family was in Atlanta. You know, it was a perfect person to pick. Um, because where I went to college, the whole point of college was to get married and to find a husband and get an MRS degree. There was no, no thought back then of having a career, doing anything on your own. So I, I did what I was told. We were engaged. I was spending my days at Emmaus House down by the stadium in Atlanta. And this was run by the Episcopal Church. And it was for kids in the neighborhood. They could take, um, we did a lot of tutorials. They we did, uh, organized activities. And we went to uh, Jekyll Island for a long weekend. And I was in a room by myself, and one of the counselors came in and raped me. Well, this was being run by nuns. So I did not, I didn't know what to do. I just ignored it. I didn't tell anybody. I went back home and said, I don't want to work at Abayas House anymore. And, and that was okay. And at this point, I was having sex with my boyfriend. And he ended up with gonorrhea courtesy of the gentleman who raped me. So I ended up going to a gynecologist at the age of 18, never been to one, ended up on medication for gonorrhea as, as did Mac. And we, we stayed together. We got married in June of 1970. And I was, 20 years old. I shouldn't have been allowed out. I mean, I shouldn't have been allowed out of the house, much less down the aisle. And I wanted to stop the wedding because I knew this wasn't right. But we had 350 people invited and my mom said no. And the reality is it was easier to get divorced two years later than it was to stop that day of wedding. So we went to the reception and we get in the car and everybody waves and throws things. And I hadn't packed a suitcase. I I just, I figured I, my, in my mind, I was going to get married and go home and everything would be the way it was before. So needless to say, I was not dealing with a full deck. Um, two years down the road, I did... Uh, leave him and come home. And my parents had me give back all the gifts that I'd gotten from the family. They were full of shame. And I got, they got me an apartment and I had a friend of mine who was running a medical transcription service. And so I started working there. And I ended up working horses for my childhood orthopedist who had spent time fixing broken arms and holes in feet. Um, and that was fun. I enjoyed that. We went to a polo game one Sunday, and I didn't have anything to drink. So I was looking around, and there was a tent on the other side that had lots of coolers and lots of people. So I cruised over there to get something to drink and met a nice guy that, younger brother of the lady who was putting on the the party there. And uh, he was divorced and he was hoping, uh, he was looking for somebody to fix him and I was looking for somebody to fix me. And needless to say, it didn't work. Uh, we did get married. Uh, I got pregnant and lost the baby. 
I got pregnant again and had a daughter in February of 1975. And Ted had thought that if he rented a barn, I could, I could run it for him and we would make money. Well, we had the barn and we had some people boarding with us, but we weren't making any money. And we were out at this barn in Douglasville, which is in the, those days, at least an hour and a half away from where I grew up. And he got really, really angry because he looked at the books and there was no money in there. And he left me and that baby in the barn at night. It was about 30 degrees. And uh, we must have had a landline because I was able to call my parents. And they came back and got me. And I went back to their house with the baby. We ended up getting divorced. So what had been happening was just this long cycle of craziness. I had seen a psychiatrist when I was a teenager. I had seen a um, the uh, therapist at Tulane University in 1960 eight and wanted to talk to them about how I felt and I did and the lady said we can't take protracted cases may I call your mother and I said no I'm 18 now you can't call my mother so she gave me a prescription for Valium so this was what my life was like. It was just, it was like being an energizer bunny and I would run against a wall and spin and run against another wall. So I would go from horses to men, back to horses. I had another disastrous relationship with a, a guy that was helping me with the barn and he had a wife. I moved into an apartment, just Lisa and me, by Victoria Station. I don't know whether y'all remember that, but it was the restaurant that was in the boxcars. And I worked there as a cocktail waitress. And I was there from 1975 to 1980. And I learned how to bus tables, and I became the first lady waiter. And I was written up in the Atlanta Journal Magazine section because I had gone to college and I was working in a restaurant. And it really was my first family. We had a group of us that were together day and night. We were allowed to drink once our shifts were over. So we would all move from working to sitting down at the bar. And the, the joke was that we were trying to keep our blood alcohol level stable. And there was one afternoon in 1978 when I was sitting at the bar by myself and this nice looking man sat down next to me and he was English and he had a wife in England and he was working in Saudi Arabia and he was in Atlanta visiting a girlfriend and I fell madly in love. It was just perfect for me. So we um, maintained a long distance relationship until 1980 and we got married. Now I was brewing English ale downstairs in my parents' kitchen. They were both at this time in, daddy was sober, mother was still drinking. Mother was about to quit drinking because my father told her that she couldn't have Lissa with her if, as long as she was drinking. So in 77, my mother got sober. So I'm brewing English ale in the kitchen, living on the third floor of their house. And they don't know there's anything wrong with me. They just assume I'm crazy and that there's nothing they can do about it. My sister came home in 1979 and her husband had overdosed on cocaine and she was sitting, she was upstairs throwing things against the wall. She had brought a friend with her who was a um, an ER doctor 
And that doctor sat at the table with my mother and father and me and said, if Sabrina came to the hospital the way she is now, I would have to admit her. So my parents put her in Peachford, which is one of the North Side treatment centers in Atlanta. So she was getting sober. I was still married. It was 1980. And in the, in the spring of 1984, Lisa had joined a brownie troop. And we had a visit from her brownie troop leader. And she said, I need y'all to sit down. She said, Lisa had told her that the stepfather, Danny, had been molesting her. And the lady who was the brownie troop leader was a, a licensed psychotherapist. And she had to, she was legally bound to call DFACS. So DFACS had taken my daughter and this lady had come to me to say, you and your mom need to go to DFACS and talk about getting your daughter back, which we did. Lisa said she was away, that they had her in foster care for a week. She was in foster care for two days. I had graduated from waiting tables to selling houses and got licensed to sell houses in 1983. I took my broker's exam a month later, which was allowed. I couldn't be a broker for two years, but I could take the exam. And I started working as a real estate agent. Danny was still working. We had his income. We were living in a house in Marietta that my parents had helped us buy. I was not getting divorced again. I couldn't go through it again. It was too shameful having had two disastrous marriages. I was going to stick this one out. We had a cool table in the den. We had an optic bar like they have in England where the bottles are upside down. I had a beer meister with a keg in it. And I had not planned on anything bad happening. Well, we went to defects and came home. And I told Danny, they said very clearly, you could have your daughter, you could have your husband, you can't have both. So I told Danny he had to leave. My father gave him a check. Danny went back to England. And Lisa and I started therapy because it was court ordered by defects. And the blessing was the second therapist I had knew about alcoholism. And my last drink was September 7th of 1983. I had gone to a friend's house. We'd been partying in a hot tub, cocaine, booze. And when I left to go back to Marietta, which was about 20 minutes away, I couldn't pick a lane on the road. I had to stop at the 7-Eleven and get a six pack so I could get back to the house. I went in to see my therapist the next day and she said, well, I must have stunk and I must have looked like hell. And she, she looked at me and she said, I can't help you if you're drinking. And I said, well, I, I won't drink. And she said, if you take something out, you have to put something in its place. Why don't you go to AA? Now, mother had been sober since 87, 77, excuse me. Daddy since 62. We knew nothing about the program. We, um, we didn't, never had been to a meeting. My father didn't like meetings because mostly back in the 60s, there were a lot of speaker meetings and he didn't like those. My mother had started the noon meeting for women at Triangle, which was our local AA clubhouse. So there I was. Now, my daughter is now nine. Um, she had had a chaotic childhood, obviously. Uh, when she was three, she told me, you're not the boss of me. And I found out later that she really meant it. It wasn't a joke. She was raised mostly by my parents. My dad was sober. 
he got the chance to be a father. She didn't have much contact with her real father. Lissa didn't. I was working nights at the restaurant. I had several boyfriends. We had a babysitter for her. And Lissa was going to an Atlanta elementary school based on my mother's address so that she could stay with mom and go to school. I volunteered as a teacher's helper because when she got to first grade, she couldn't read. Well, of course she couldn't read. You know, I mean, I didn't teach her anything. So. I did write this down. So what happened was I went to a meeting on Tuesday, September 9th. I had a friend of mine who was in the program take me because I thought somebody had to take you. Uh, it was a triangle club. It was the noon meeting. Um, lots of young people, lot, well, 30s, lots of 30s. Uh, Long-term sobriety, we didn't have much. We had Dal, who had gotten sober in California and had been sober for 40 years, but everybody else was young and just getting through it one day at a time. And I believe if I had not had alcohol, I don't think I would have lived to 34. The alcohol was the only thing that kept the insanity manageable. And even though my life had been total chaos, at least I was alive. And the phrase that how it works says some of us have grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. And they were talking about me. I came to my first meeting at Triangle. And then within two weeks, I was 13th step by a guy who went to a lot of meetings at Triangle, and he was separated from his wife, who actually was living in a town south of Atlanta. So he was still married, and he hit on me, and I was pleased. You know, I didn't know how to have a life without guys in it, because they were the ones that were always rescuing me. My sponsor was a friend of my mom's, and, you know, we obviously, she... The, the people in the program got this guy to leave me alone. Unfortunately, I enjoyed going out with the guys, so I, I did not follow any of the, the rules about no relationships for the first 12 months. I didn't follow any rules at all, but I came to meetings. I had my girlfriends. We would go out and eat dinner at Shoney's. It was the first time I felt safe. I think when I sat down in that meeting and heard what it felt like to be an alcoholic and the hole in the gut and, and the anxiety and the not feeling that you fit in anywhere and just being so lonely. That's, that's when I knew I was home and I had a, a voice in my head saying, have you had enough? And I said, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. So I came to meetings. I did what I was told. I went out with guys, but I had to come back to the same meeting. And if they were there, I had to look at them. And I got over it. And my the ladies at Triangle were my real friends. And I would have taken a blanket and pillow and lived there. It was the only safe place I had in the whole world. In October of... 87, my boyfriend took me and my AA roommate on a rafting trip on the Ocoee. Um, that was a Whitewater River. It was actually the Whitewater River used at the 1996 Olympics. It was my first experience with that. Then Ressa suggested that we take a kayak class. So we took the last beginner kayak class in 1987 which lasted a week. I bought a kayak. I bought racks to go on the top of my Mazda. I bought a dry suit. I joined the Georgia Canoeing Association and I spent every weekend on the river. It was the first time I'd had fun. 
just just doing something that wasn't dependent on anybody else. I had friends, made friends of the group, and I was really happy for the first time. And this was the first three years in Triangle taught me the basics that have worked for the next 37 years. It taught me that this disease is fatal and will last my lifetime. When my thoughts are weird, it's the disease talking to me. Feelings are not facts. And you have to talk to somebody with more experience than you have. My best thinking is what got me to Triangle. Learn from the old timers. Wear this program like a loose garment. One day at a time, first things first, next right thing. I did have to deal with my codependency. Um, and I think in the early 80s, we were really just beginning to talk about codependency. It was Codependent No More was the big book. Um, and the reason I was so entangled with men had to do with with um, this illness that I had. In April of 88, excuse me, it was March, February of 88, I went to see a therapist. We were doing group therapy. It was women in recovery. He was very smart. We started talking. He knew what everybody was doing. I mean, he knew where we all were because all we had to do was open our mouths and talk. Well, now I know that when you talk to women who are in the first three years of sobriety, it's a pretty predictable route that they're on. So it wasn't like he was hearing anything new. I told him what my life was like. And he said, as long as you're doing what you're doing, you're not going to get better. And he had me sign a contract with him that I would not go out with any man who did not have their divorce papers their first year's chip, and they didn't and didn't have a job. That was my bottom, that was my criteria. He also told me that he didn't want me dating anybody at all. For the next six months, he wanted me to go out with groups and learn how to get by being one of many rather than one-on-one. -on -one. In April of 88, I was with my roommate, Russa, at the Nana Hala Outdoor Center, we were staying in the women's hostel and we were going to paddle that weekend. And there was a guy in the men's hostel who came out and was the new paddler. And it was Haynes. And we hung out, the three of us, that weekend because we were the only three not drinking. And somewhere along the line, somebody dropped a bumper sticker about first things first or next right thing. And we realized that Haynes was in the program and he had a he had eight months uh, and he did not have his divorce papers, but we did start paddling together. We started paddling tandem and I was a semi-experienced kayaker having paddled all winter. And he was a flatwater paddler from Florida and we, we managed, we did really well. So we paddled together that spring and that summer. I went out with one of his friends from EPA who still drank and we went out to several parties with EPA people where there was a lot of booze and Haynes was sober and I was sober and Eric was not sober and I'm on 285 with him and he's drunk and he's driving and I'm thinking to myself this is not right you know I'm I'm working on four years of sobriety I need I know better so I told him I couldn't go out with him anymore because he drank. And he said, well, everybody drinks. And I said, no, they don't. So Haynes got his first year's chip and his divorce papers the same week in August. I don't think he ever had much of a chance. I was kind of all over him. My daughter had started uh, in boarding school when she was in fifth grade when I got sober and she had gone on a one girl crusade to stop mom, um, fathers and stepfathers from molesting their children. 
And this was difficult when you were in a public school um, and because nobody could shut her up. I mean, she was just, she was on a mission. And they suggested that a boarding school might be a good idea. And my mother and my father and I met with the principal and, and uh, she ended up going to a school in North and uh, New York called Lake, uh, called, I'm blanking, North Country School. And she was there for sixth, seventh and eighth grades. And I, it was had to be a blessing because my, between my mother, my father and me, you know, there was no sanity anywhere. We had no program. We had no plan. We had nothing. So I stayed going to meetings at Triangle uh, till Haynes moved to my house in Marietta and I discovered church meetings. I'd never been to a church meeting. I had, I was scared of church meetings. I, I knew where I was with Triangle, but I was too frightened to change to another type of meeting. So luckily I went with him and we became involved in um, East Cobb, Marietta. He was a GSR for one group. I was a GSR for another group. We went to state assemblies together. We were still paddling on the weekend. Haynes has Haynes' job had him in Florida a lot. I went from selling houses to selling land in 1984. I thought I was going to make a lot of money, and I did have a, a big closing in 1988. And I thought, oh goody, I'm going to be, I'm going to make money every year. And, and unfortunately, it doesn't work that way in the land business. Um, we were planning on getting married in August of 1990. I had a big deal that was closing. It fell apart. It came back together again. It did close. Uh, but that was the end of money for me. A rocket invaded Kuwait and the land market was in the tank. So I got a part-time job at Neiman Marcus. So I'm working Thursday nights and Sunday afternoons at Demons. I'm doing land. Um, I'm going to AA meetings. Every once in a while, we get to go to the river and paddle. Liz is in boarding school, and Haynes is traveling a lot. So we really didn't see each other that much, which was probably the only reason the marriage survived, because I was still just bonkers. I had voices in my head telling me to, that he wasn't good enough for me and he wasn't handsome enough and blah, 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 blah. And I would just say to these voices in my head, shut the F up. We're going to be old people together and I don't want to hear it. So we we just, you know, we were, we were living. And um, Christmas Eve of 1994, my father died. He had been at the hospital since November with lung cancer. And he had just had one crisis after another. And they told us that he was dying that day. And he was just as green as he could be because he had no oxygen in his blood. And my mother had been the chairman of the board for the Center of Puppetry Arts, which was Jim Henson and Kermit the Frog. And my dying father looked exactly like Kermit the Frog. And we all stood around him and we were all sober. And he died about 6.30. And so we could go home because we didn't know how we were gonna have Christmas. He was too ill to go home and he wasn't having any fun. So he was 75. And I'm now 74, a little scary. In April of 1995, on my parents' anniversary, I got the diagnosis of breast cancer. And by May, they had operated, whacked that one off, done a reconstruction, and I was starting chemo. We went to a group. There was another lady in the group who was doing had breast cancer, doing exactly the same chemo that I was doing. 
and she could have chemo in the morning and go to a meeting and go out for dinner. And I would have chemo in the morning and I would be so sick that I couldn't get out of bed for 10 days. I couldn't, the Zofran just killed me. And they had something called chytral that was supposed to help with the, the, the sickness, the nausea, and it gave me the whirlies. So I just, I just gutted it out. And I had four doses of chemo over five months. It kicked me into menopause. So I was having hot flashes on top of nausea. Um, I was not a happy camper. I went to one recovery group session uh, through the hospital and it was absolutely terrifying. The women who were in there were dying and it was just heartbreaking. And I came back to the, to the program and I went to meetings with my bald head and, and I worked the program and I thought, well, I've, I got, I already have alcoholism. That's that's lifetime and potentially fatal. And now I have cancer. So I'll just deal with both of them. And I had a nurse come from Emory who wanted to know every drink I'd had and every drug I'd taken from the time I was, well, 13, because they were coming up with a connection between breast cancer and alcoholism in teenagers. So I think I also learned about Deepak Chopra and perfect health. And perfect health says that your body is supposed to eat up these little cancer cells. If you keep yourself healthy, you can stay ahead of it. And I haven't gotten sick again, 1995. In 1997, a friend introduced me to Tai Chi and I've been doing that since 1997. Haynes raised three stepdaughters the oldest of which now had three three little girls, and we stayed involved with them, and that was good. Uh, in 2010, I went to my home group meeting in Big Canoe. We had moved up there because Haynes had retired in 2005, and I met a young woman who had just come in, and I asked her if she had a sponsor, and she said no, and I said, well, I will be your temporary sponsor. And I found out that she had two and a half year old triplets and she was living in Big Canoe because there was security and her ex-husband who was a drug dealer could not get through security to get to her and the kids. And I told Haynes it won't hurt us and it'll help her. And the triplets are now 16 and we are their godparents. And we have this sort of expanded family We had, I had come from being enabled by my parents and my daughter, we had bought her a house. We bought her a farm. She was making money as an equine therapist. It went on and on and on. Well, Haynes had retired, we couldn't afford it. In 2018, my mother died. Um, and Haynes and I looked at each other and said, we need to stop with Lissa. I couldn't stop before because my mother was enabling her. And if I had stopped what I was doing and stopped financially supporting her, I would have lost my mother. And I wasn't prepared to do that. So we ended up having to pay for the farm because I had actually refinanced it twice. And I had we had given her 25% of the farm. Now, you're not allowed to refinance what you don't own 100% of. And as a real estate broker, I should have been aware of that. But because she was my daughter, I didn't think of her as another person. So luckily, I went to an attorney who worked with my company and explained what was going on. And he says, you have got to get yourself out of this situation. She can sue you. You can be arrested for fraud. You could go to jail, you can lose your license. And my daughter had hired a lawyer. So Haynes and I took the money that my mother had given us and paid off the farm. And we continued, Lisa and I, to have conversations. She had never forgiven me for drinking. Her 
and being drunk the first nine years of her life. And there was never anything I could do to make amends that she would accept. So in October of 2019, my therapist suggested that Haynes tell her that we were not going to communicate unless Haynes was on the call. And I haven't spoken to her since then. So now I'm, I'm trying. Well, I'm winding down with work. I'm 74. I need to wind down. Um, I found out that I push myself all the time, whether it's canoeing or real estate or Tai Chi or whatever it is. I can't do what I used to do. I'm now 5'2". I used to be 5'5". Five five. Things are changing without my permission. I I'm, I'm spend my time in service work. We became GSRs. I became a DCM. We uh, gave a lot to the program, and the program has given enormous amounts back to me. We still have a very good group of sober people in this part of the world. Big Canoe has a meeting that we have every Saturday morning. There's another meeting called Trinity that changes this whole group. Um, with my extra time, I volunteer for nonprofits. I've tried to turn into a decent human being. And we have lots of people in our life and lots of volunteer daughters and volunteer sons. And, and uh, we have uh, group dinners for Thanksgiving and or Christmas and have everybody from Big Canoe come and all the people that don't have families here come and join with us. So, you know, I, I can't do what I did in my 40s and 50s. I'm sober. I'm grateful to be sober. I'm grateful to have this program. I hope that this litany of craziness is uh, of use to somebody. It was hard to write. It's hard to go back there again. Thank you. Okay.